Hi, my name is Shani and I'm a 2D animator and a prop designer from Dublin in Ireland. I'm kind of being blinded against this window. I've been working professionally in the animation industry here for about five years. I'm currently the sole prop designer on a show called Alva's World. And before that, I animated on a bunch of kids TV shows. Uh, my first design job was on a Disney XD show called Space Chickens in Space. Before the global pandemic, I would go to a studio to do my job, but obviously you know, like a lot of people, I've been working from home for the past year, which is why there's a desk in my kitchen. <laughs> the biggest difference is, you know, obviously I can't just go over to someone's desk and ask them a question or, you know, talk through something with them. I have to call them instead. But basically the work is the same. And I thought it'd be fun on this now overcast day to uh, go through what a week of doing my job looks like. I think this role in particular might be a little misunderstood. I think people have a fair idea of what a background artist does. I think people have, you know, a pretty fair idea of what a character designer does. But I was months into my first design job when one of my friends outside of animation was like, here, what is, what are you, what, what are you doing? What is it? Are you making stuff out of wood? <laughs> no, that's not my job. But to be fair to them, I also didn't really know what it was until I was on the job. And it turns out, oh yeah, I really like this. Basically, a, a prop is any object that a character picks up or interacts with. And that could be, you know, a space blaster or a banana or the door of a cabinet or a game controller, right? Props need to be designed just as backgrounds and characters themselves need to be designed. We are a part of the art department and we answer to the art director. Uh, their job is to direct us, to make sure that the things we design are cohesive and fit into the world of the show. My experience is largely in 2D animation for children's television using rigged characters. I've done some preschool stuff. I think the show I'm on now is the five to eight age range. And I think Space Chickens might have been a little bit older than that. So basically that's kind of where I'm coming from when I talk about this. I'm sure if you're working on a 3D production, it's a little bit different. It's probably different again if you're working on a movie, but I'd have to imagine that largely the process is pretty similar. Now I can't use any official production art from the show that I'm on because uh, it's under a non-disclosure agreement. That's in my contract, you know, it says it's not out yet, so I can't talk about it in detail. I think pretty much all I can say about it is I am working on it. Um, and I also am not gonna use any art from shows that I've worked on previously because I don't own any of it. I don't own any of those shows and it just doesn't feel very appropriate to use that for a personal YouTube video, you know? It would definitely make the process easier if I could just use that to, to show you uh, what the job is, but I can't. So I'm gonna have to make up a show instead and pretend I'm designing for that. So these are three characters that I've been messing with for the past few months. I don't know what all of their names are yet. The designs certainly aren't final. I don't know if it's gonna be for a comic or a short film or what. All I know is that they're in a band together called Kitten Spit and you know, it's gonna revolve around that. I'm thinking like rocket power, but about a band, right? So for the purposes of this video, we're gonna pretend that I'm designing props for Kitten Spit, the animated series. And uh, this show, just like my day job, runs on a weekly turnaround schedule. So it's, it's pretty tight. Basically what that means is we spend a couple of days a week designing uh, new props for a future episode and then we spend the rest of the week finishing off a different one and then next week we do it all over again so it kind of does neatly fit into that you know week in a life thing kind of so to start explaining to you how this thing works basically <laughs> like generally very generally a writer writes a script and they work with the show's director they get feedback and they shape it in the right direction and then once that script is finished and approved Someone from the production management side of things will take it, go through it and break it down onto a spreadsheet so that the art department can see what needs to be designed for that new episode. And that will be broken down in terms of backgrounds, characters, effects animation and props. And that's how my week begins. So Monday morning, I tumble out of bed, I stumble to the kitchen and I pour myself a cup of ambition. And by that I mean, I never really get up early enough and then sort of don't give myself enough time to eat and then I spend too long in the shower because I'm half asleep. Oh my God, I'm doing a wrap. So anyway, then I'm at my desk for like 8.58 with like wet hair and a bit of toast in my mouth. I don't know how I'm gonna commute ever again. Oh my God. So the first thing I do is I take this new script that's come in and I go through it to figure out what the episode is about. In this case, and this is all made up, Wit's guitar is destroyed. They've played a show and uh, stage light, you know, comes loose from the rafters and 
falls on it, smashes to bits, so he has to get a job in a cafe to buy a new one, right? So I'm imagining we're kind of a few episodes in at this point, so I've already designed his old guitar. Here it is. And now I can see from the design tracker, the, the spreadsheet open in front of me, that I'm also going to need to design a crushed version of that guitar, you know, smashed to bits. I'm probably going to need to design the stage light that fell on it, probably a regular version and a cracked version from when it, you know, hit the ground. Um, I'm going to need to do a new guitar for him that he gets at the end. In terms of the cafe, you know, I might have to design a takeaway cup, a tip jar, a bucket and a mop, a jug of milk, a muffin, cafe stuff, you know what I mean? And also for this episode, I'm going to give him a, a phone. And like normally I'd have maybe, I don't know, my current job, 10 to 15 things to do. And I have like a couple of days to do it, but I'm not going to show you all that because, you know, you'll get the point if I show you just like three or four, right? Hey, I'm in a different location now. So as I go through the script, I'll make some really loose doodles with a nice inky pen. I just use a lined refill pad because I always have it on my desk to make notes. So it's just handy to grab. And also I'm just figuring stuff out. So these don't have to be good drawings. So the paper doesn't have to be good either. You'll have a list of the things you need to design on the tracker, but I also think it's important to read through the script yourself so you'll understand the context for the things you're designing. You might have an idea of the scale of something in your head, and maybe it's not explicitly stated in the script, but then as you go through it, you'll read some kind of context clues that recontextualizes how big the thing needs to be. For example, lots of characters have um, giant heads and little arms and bodies, and so if the script has them put something under their arm, then that kind of dictates the shape and scale of whatever the prop is. And also uh, sometimes in a script, a character will be holding something and then like a couple of lines later, they'll be interacting with something else with both hands. And it's like, well, what happened to that first thing, Siren? And um, you know, maybe it'll be something as simple as they just put it behind their back or you might have to redesign a couple of things to account for that. A lot of the job is kind of problem solving in that way. Um, a lot. Of, a lot of animation is, is problem solving really, so it's, it's definitely a good skill to have if you can kind of look out for future problems and address them before they come up. Once I have an idea of how I'm gonna tackle everything, or most of it anyway, I'll start to draw it up properly in Photoshop. And I do that using my 22 inch Cintiq. I was really never ever able to <laughs> get used to using a regular Wacom tablet. The disconnect between my hand and the screen just like messed me up. Um, so this is really one of the most valuable things I own. And I always start with the easiest props. You have to like, you know, Take it handy, ease yourself into the week. So uh, we're gonna start with the coffee cup, the phone and the new guitar. And at this point, I don't really have to worry about providing a bunch of new angles if it's a simple enough prop. If it's important for the episode, then I'll do a front view and a back view. For the most part, that's not necessary. These are just designs that are gonna go to the storyboard artist that they can reference when they're boarding their episode. So for now, uh, a flat view usually does the job. You might be thinking, I didn't really spend a lot of time developing these ideas before I decided to go ahead with them. And that's partially because I had them in my mind to begin with, because I had to plan this video out ahead of time. But also, I think as your instincts develop, you get a sense of what will work pretty quickly. They told us in college a lot that you should never go with your first idea. And there's probably some truth to that for a time, but I think as your sense of design improves, you can, you probably should in a lot of cases, because the reality working animation for TV is that schedules are tight and you don't usually have the time to exhaust every design possibility for every prop you have to do. Usually I get the gist of what I want pretty quickly and any designing or developing that I would do beyond that would just be for the sake of it. I think there's a real skill in identifying what works and doing it quickly. When I'm finished drawing a prop, I lay it out like this. The big version lets you see it clearly and the small version shows the scale of it in relation to the character. I'll upload those three to the server and then I'll mark them for review on the tracker. And with all of that work finished, that's my Monday done. Normally, obviously, I'd have a lot more work to do than that, but for the sake of this video, we're calling that my day. Uh, just imagine that, but like times three. <laughs> On Tuesday morning, I can get straight into the drawing because I'll have already worked out what I'm gonna do from the day before. So we'll start with the tip jar. I've had this idea of something I wanna animate for a while where a character can't open a jar of pickles, so they smash it on the ground. And uh, I thought it'd be funny to use that idea for the tip jar. So imagine Wit wants to check how many tips they've gotten at the end of a shift. And despite the fact that this thing is massive and you can clearly see into it, and you can clearly see that there are six coins. And despite the fact that you can easily reach into that opening and uh, take the coins out, he decides to smash it on the ground and then count them. And so I'd have to do a smashed version of that prop as well. Next up was the smashed guitar. And this one was the hardest by far because I just did not know how I was gonna tackle it. And I wanna be clear, I wrote this video. So I picked that for myself. I chose to do it. 
At first, I tried to do it as if the light had fallen and kind of embedded into the front of it, but it just didn't look very good. Um, and then I tried to do it a little bit more realistically where it was like the body and the neck had separated, but I didn't like that either. If I had an art director on hand, I could have just asked them and the problem would have been solved really quickly, but I don't. It's just me here trying to make all those decisions. Once I realized that the way to go was to just have it smashed to bits, it was easy. Um, but you know, it's a pretty good example of what I was just talking about a minute ago. What do you do if the schedule is tight and you just can't figure something out? Luckily, it doesn't happen that often, but when it does, it's not a big deal because it's a give and take. Some props go by really quickly and they're very easy. And so you can sort of take the time that you would have spent on them and you know allow it for a more difficult one. Of course, you want the designs to be as good as they can be. So I'm not saying you absolutely race through every single one. It's just that you don't always have the time like that to spend on every single one, that's all. With those done, I'll put them on the server and set them to review on the tracker, which brings me to retakes. By this point, the art director has probably already had a chance to look at what I submitted the day before. The coffee cup and the guitar, all good, no notes, approved. But the phone has a retake. I've had this idea for a while that all of Wit's technology needs to be outdated. I drew him in December, just gone, four months ago, uh, 2020, where he's having band practice over Zoom and he's using like a Windows 95 computer, one of those big CRT monitors. I think it's like the idea is maybe he doesn't care about it enough to update it, but also he lives with his Nana. So I think uh, it kind of comes from that. It's a trend I want to continue. Sorry, uh, his grandmother, his Mima. <laughs> I know like people have different words for it. So I'm trying to account for a wide audience. You're probably like, what's a Nana? Oh, it's Meepus. <laughs> so the note on the phone might be, Hey, sorry, we know this hasn't come up before now, but it's gonna come up down the line. His technology needs to be outdated so he can't have a smartphone. Could you design up some kind of early 2000s flip phone instead? And so I'll go and do that. And having to redo an entire design like that for a retake is, is pretty rare. They're usually a lot smaller, just like a color tweak or something, but I just wanted to illustrate what that process is like. And you know, just because we're not using that design now doesn't mean it was a total waste of time. We can probably use it for another character somewhere down the line. I'm wrapping again. <laughs> when all the concepts are finished, they're collected into a file and they're sent off to a storyboard artist so that they can reference those designs when they board their episode. And that brings me into Wednesday. By this point in the week, uh, gets a little bit harder to tumble out of bed and stumble to the kitchen and pour myself a cup of ambition, but we persist because <laughs> I've rent to pay. So after a few weeks, the storyboards are done and an editor will take them and put them into an animatic. And basically what that is, if you're not sure, um, oh, you know, if you look up Pixar animatics on YouTube, there's a bunch of them and that should kind of uh, clue you in. Um, essentially, it's when the storyboard panels are timed out and set to scratch dialogue and music and sound effects. And it just gives you an idea of how the episode will play out so you can tell if it's working or not. The way shows are made is like this uh, constant rolling cycle. So every episode will be at a different stage of production as it moves down the pipeline. So I'd never normally be in a position where I'm designing concepts for an episode and viewing the animatic in the same week. But for the purposes of this video, we're gonna imagine that we're now at the animatic stage for the cafe episode of Kitten Spit, the animated series. And uh, many, many weeks have passed. On a Wednesday morning, a bunch of us will sit down together and go through the animatic. And that will be the series director, the animation director, the art director, uh, you know, scene prep, production people, everyone from the art department. And we're all looking out for things that relate to our job so we'll be asking questions just clarifying things you know flagging potential problems basically just trying to get a sense of what needs to be done to progress this episode forward so it can go to animation as a prop designer what i'm looking at for is new angles that i need to add to existing props or uh, you know maybe if there's any props that weren't in the script but they're now in the boards or maybe we missed them or they just got added whatever um that kind of thing you know um so for example if a character is drinking from this coffee cup, when they tilt it up to their mouth, now you see the underside, so I'll have to do that. And you know, maybe if they tilt it forward or if the camera's like looking down at it on a table, then you'll see into it, so I'll have to draw that as well. In terms of the tip jar, I'm imagining that when the board artist had him lifted up to smash it, they decided to have him lifted above his head, so I'll have to do that angle as well. And the reason we, you know, do that now instead of beforehand is because it's, it's kind of impossible to know exactly what angles you're going to need to provide. Um, because it's, you know, the possibilities are endless and it all depends on how the shot is set up. So it just makes more sense to wait until now and then see, and then you're not 
wasting time on designs that don't end up getting used. The guitars would definitely be more tricky to move around because they're a more complex shape. And you can imagine that if you're making a show about a band, it's probably something that's gonna come up quite a lot. Anytime a character, you know, turns or tilts forward, holding a guitar, you know, you're gonna see different sides of it. And so it would probably get to the point where you have so many angles that it could kind of cover most eventualities. So it would probably be like designing a lot in the first few months and then less so as it goes on. I played around with it to try and see how much you could get away with by just squishing down that front view and rotating it and skewing it and that kind of thing. But I'm really not too sure. I think like there's no way to cheat around that. You're just gonna have to draw a lot of guitars. Obviously I don't have a storyboard for this episode, so I'm kind of making it up as I go along, but like I'm imagining the light um, that falls onto his old guitar. If the board artist decides to stage it so that you're looking up at it as it falls, then I'd probably have to do some kind of front angle or you know, if the director's like, nah, let's do that from the side for clarity or whatever, then maybe the design I have would work just, or maybe it needs to rotate and tumble and spin and then I'd have to do a bunch of them. It, it really just depends on like how the shot's set up, what the director wants. I usually try and do all the drawing of the new angles on a Wednesday so that I can just get them out of the way as one big chunk and then turn my attention completely to vectorizing and rigging, which is how I spend my Thursday. I find it really difficult to explain what rigging is if you're not already familiar with it. In terms of 2D animation, it's basically vectorizing the artwork and turning it into something that the animators can use in whatever program they're in. And in terms of my day job, we're in Adobe Flash or Adobe Animate. Uh, for characters, you're basically creating a digital puppet that the animators can move around by separating all of the elements onto different layers and giving them control over every moving part. Props, I mean, it's a the same concept it's pretty similar but it's probably easier to show you what they are instead of describing them but it would take way too long to go through the entire process so i'm just going to show you a couple of props that i did up as examples the type of rigging that we do in animate is pretty simple i know some programs like toon boom harmony for example you can do some pretty complicated stuff and um, like you can set deformers onto artwork so that you can manipulate it and you have more control over the kinds of shapes you make I've animated in Harmony, so I'm, I'm kind of familiar with how rigs work, but I by no means would I be able to uh, set one up myself. When I worked on Space Chickens, we would vectorize everything in Harmony, but then that all got sent off to riggers, so I'm really not familiar with that more complicated process. So Animate is, is kind of simple, or more simple, um, but you can still do some cool stuff with it. Okay, so I've got this pretty simple flip phone rig. If we go into it, you can see that top piece, the bottom piece, the hinge, they're all separate. Oh yeah, so the hinge is split in two. The reason for that is because we've got this closed shape, which I drew at the concept stage, and this open shape. Um, so when it's open, this needs to sit behind the hinge, and when it's closed, this part sits above. Um, and so what I've done is inside this hinge, there's two frames. The first one is the full hinge, and the second is just this little circle part. And so, Above everything, I have this circle part just uh, sitting by itself, and that's kind of a, a cool thing. Um, and then obviously I've drawn this in-between shape so that the animators can animate the phone opening. And bear in mind, I've been designing for like a year, so my animation brain is rusty, but kind of something like this, that kind of works, right? It's only three shapes, but uh, you skew them and you rotate them. That's the same shape. That's the middle shape. And then, then that just kind of skews and bounces. And it kind of sells the idea that this phone has been flipped open, right? And you can imagine that for every turnaround angle of this phone, so a side view and a back view, whatever, I'd have to do these uh, three positions as well so that the phone could be flipped open. So that's pretty much the phone. Uh, it's really simple. There's only like, like three moving parts. I've also rigged up this tip jar, which is super simple too, um, but it uses some masking. I just thought that'd be kind of cool um, to show you. So if we go into it, uh, let me just hide these first of all, and then I can start to explain. So I've got um, everything split up onto different layers. So I've got this top layer of glass, and then this bottom layer of glass, and each coin is its own symbol so that when the jar is lifted or thrown, the coins can uh, jiggle around and, and move by themselves. And the highlight as well is its own piece. And the reason it's important to split things up like this is because let's imagine, whoop, imagine we wanna have a character reach inside, Here's an arm that I uh, lovingly drew earlier. Um, I can set the arm layer in between the 
top glass and the bottom glass and now it looks like the arm is reaching inside and it's affected by that opacity. So I mentioned masking a minute ago, so I'll just kind of show you what that is really quickly. Um, if I hide everything. Okay, so this is the main glass shape and I've just turned it red to so that I can identify clearly that it's a mask. Um, so this mask here is masking this sticker shape. So if I, yeah. So at the moment you can see the whole thing because it's uh, the sticker is sitting inside the big main shape. Um, but if I was to move the sticker over like this, uh, that's something I've done earlier to save time. If I lock it now, you can see that the sticker is being cut off by that mask shape. Basically what a mask does is this piece of artwork is constrained to the shape of the mask above it. The reason we use masks is because um, now it looks like the jar is rotating. See, I've kind of roughly animated the coins, right? It doesn't look super great on the flat, but you can imagine if the character was lifting that up and we're kind of putting in a fake rotation as well, you can really start to kind of sell more movements with a very, very simple trick. I've also done up this shape here. So you can kind of like imagine, oh, I should have just animated it, but I didn't. <laughs> uh, you know, this shape getting lifted up and rotating around. And if you do it quick enough, kind of hide the, the shape change in the movement. You can kind of cut to this shape above the head and uh, you know, the coins are rattling around separately because you know, just like, uh, oh boy, it's falling apart at the seams. Just like that other, uh, the first shape, this uh, piece of glass is its own shape and all the coins are their own shape so they can all move independently. With minimal shapes, you can start to kind of uh, sell more complex movements. And I've also uh, put in these broken pieces for when it's smashed on the ground and each one of these shards is its own piece and obviously each one of these coins is its own piece so that when the jar is smashed on the ground the animator has full control to have them just fly around the place and, and bounce on the floor however they want. So these are very basic rigs but it's kind of hard to imagine up a difficult rig just off the top of your head they kind of like come up when you're not expecting them to you know sometimes you think something's gonna be easy and it's like ah damn it. <laughs> um, but you know th those basic ideas of, of masking and splitting everything up into its own symbol and on different layers so that you have full control over it. Those are the basic building blocks of rigging and um, you know, everything uses those two things. It's not that the process is particularly complicated, it's just time consuming. So I spend two and a half days doing this, but it's just because drawing stuff up takes some time. So this is the shortest part of the video. Um, and yet I spend half my week doing it, like two and a half days pretty much. But uh, it, it's just like, I didn't show it all because it's just kind of time consuming and probably wouldn't be that interesting to watch me do it. I just want to point out that these floral curtains were here when we moved in. What can we do? We have no storage. Brown corduroy headboard, that was here too. <laughs> Rigging is a lot of work, so I'll usually spend my entire Friday doing that. And actually, I probably would have moved on to it by Wednesday afternoon as well. So I'll start rigging in the morning, and then I might get a message that says, hey, uh, this FX animation for this prop is finished. Can you put it in, please? So yeah, cool, no problem. That's all part of my job. So I switch my focus away from rigging and I'll do that and that might take five, 10, 15 minutes, who knows? When that's finished, I'll turn my attention back to rigging, but then I might get a message that says, hey, we need a color fix on the lava lamp from a few episodes back. It's blending in with the background. Imagine that turquoise color looked totally cool. Turquoise, turquoise, Tur turquoise color looked totally cool in a dark antique shop and then he gets it home to his bedroom. It's kind of the same color as the wall, so it's like blending in a bit. So we might make it a pink color uh, for contrast. So when that's done, I'll turn my attention back to rigging. But then I might get a message from scene prep that says, hey, I'm not super sure how this file works. Can you kind of talk me through it? Or the hopefully much rarer, uh, you missed an angle. <laughs> it's scene 40 in episode three. Could you take a look at that, please? And so I'll pull up the animatic and I'll go through that and like, oh, damn, yeah, sorry. Turns out I did miss one. So I'll do that up for them and that will be, what? 20, 30 minutes. When that's finished, I might get a message from comp. Uh, there's something specific they need to do and they need to talk me through what I need to provide for them or there's a problem we need to you know, discuss, a workaround. And then I might get a message from backgrounds. Uh, I need to provide a PNG image for them that they can stick into a background. The reason I bring all this up is because my week is never as straightforward as I've made it seem. I kind of just need to lay it out in a way that was easier to follow, you know? My best days, no one comes near me. I'm kind of just left to my own devices and I can just focus on one task, uh, attention completely unbroken. But 
that's not always the case. And at any point during my week, I might have to dip out of what I'm doing to address uh, a couple of notes or you know, do some other small tasks. And it's all part of my job. And it can be a little bit tricky sometimes when you're swapping focus around a lot. Some days, you know, are a lot worse than others maybe. And it feels like every 30 minutes, you're just onto something new. But you get good at managing your own time and you kind of just have to be able to go with the flow and uh, learn to be adaptive for whatever you're needed for that day. Designing stuff is so much fun because you're taking something which has only ever been words on a script until that point and you're like visualizing it for the first time and it becomes a bit more real in a way and it's enormously satisfying and it's challenging in the best way and the problem solving aspect of the job is it makes you feel like a big brain genius, or at least it, it does for me anyway, because I don't know, maybe I'm just not that smart to begin with, but um, it feels like you get a sense of, of ownership over the show and, and it feels like my input is valued in a way that, I don't know, I, I, I just don't really feel when I'm just animating on a show. And I say that as someone who absolutely loves to animate. And, you know, as a designer, when I start to see uh, scenes come in animated for the first time I get jealous because I know that that is a different kind of fun you know I really like my job I think this video is probably proof of that because I sure did spend a lot of time thinking about work in my spare time I hope it's been interesting and informative and clear and I know it's probably going to be pretty long because my voice is starting to go hoarse because I've been talking for a while so uh, I appreciate you watching if you've gotten this far Thanks very much and goodbye.